you guys are impacting lives. And I just want you to know how awesome that is through your giving and what that means. And so I want to talk about a blessed life today. Uh, and this is the new series that I'm starting because you need to realize just having stuff doesn't mean you're blessed. Okay, let me go to this side of the church. How many, just because you got a lot of stuff doesn't mean you're blessed. It just doesn't. It just means you got a lot of stuff. It just does. And there's, in God's eyes, what is a blessed life? What truly is a blessed life? And so we want to look at that. But I also just want to give a quick shout out because I know a lot of you are new and we have different events that we're doing. We're going to start our small groups up again after the first of the year. We revamped our growth track, which has been great. It filled up this month, and it filled up last month, and so you need to sign up for next month. And so we, we, we retooled that. We're doing the same thing with our group. So those will start again the first of the year. And one of the groups we have is a softball team. They meet on Mondays is, uh, you know, for this season. They have all the guys. But if that's something you're interested in, you can go to the information desk, sign up. You want to get involved in that. Maybe we have two teams or you can get involved for next year. Um, but just know they meet every Monday out at Water Park, at the Water Park on Livingston. That's when they play at 6.30 and 7.30. So, hey, go out and support them if you like that. Um, God's awesome. God wants to do great things in your life. You know, there's no greater desire that I have as a pastor is whatever I preach on Sunday, my greatest desire is that you can take something and live it Monday to Saturday. As a pastor, I haven't done my job if I can't give you practical truths that you can walk out of here and it changed your life to bring freedom, to bring victory, to get closer to God, to help you overcome, to bring you into a closer relationship with God and start understanding his voice and how he leads. And most of us in our lives haven't grown up in a church. Most of us that come into the church, you're looking for answers. You're looking for answers. We're all looking for answers. And the Bible has them. We just have to believe that the Bible is still for today and that God wants to do great things and help you in your life. And that's why we need to reach the lost and we need to help those come in because God wants you to have a blessed life. And sometimes, you know, we live in Naples, and you see all the wealth, you see all that, and go, man, people really have a blessed life. You know, I've been, I've been doing this for many, many, many years, pastoring. And can I just tell you, whether you have a lot or a little, everybody has the same problems. Let's try that again. I haven't met anybody who doesn't have the same problems in life. They look for fulfillment, and these people have everything. And their marriages are falling apart and they're not happy. And I've had people who have nothing and their marriages are falling apart and they're not happy. Everyone has the same issues. And the one thing I can tell you is this. Without God, it doesn't matter if you have a little or a lot. You've got to have God to change your life. And God wants you blessed. Because a prosperous life is when God blesses you his way through his word, and we understand what it's for. So we're going to look at that today and in this series. We're going to look at attitudes. We're going to look at motives. We're going to look at selfishness because selfishness, not it destroys your life. And selfish people aren't happy people. They're just not. When, when people are takers, you're not happy. Givers are happy. Helping others, man, that's what just transforms your life. Going on missions trips and filling up shoeboxes to go to Guatemala. And just even hearing my son growing up, man, you know, th those are memories. And God wants to bless you. And that's his desire. It's my desire. But today is about attitude. God deals with attitude when it comes to a blessed life. That's where it starts. You know, I love what Zig Ziglar said. It's not your aptitude, but your attitude that determines your altitude. So much of life is about perspective and attitude. So let's start with that today. We're going to start in Matthew 7. It says this, Do not judge others, and you will not be judged. 
for you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard which you will be judged. Luke 6, 37, Williams translation. Then stop criticizing others and you will never be criticized. Stop condemning others and you will never be condemned. Now, Luke 6, verse 38 in the Williams, first verse and last verse. Just a portion of it. Practice forgiving others and you will be forgiven. Turn to your neighbor and say, I forgive you for how you drove here today. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and the person you came with and say, I forgive you for making us late. Oh, why are you laughing? I forgive you for not helping me get the kids ready. Ooh, ouch, ow. Look at verse 38 now in the Williams, the full way. Practice forgiving others and you will be forgiven. Practice giving to others and they will give to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. People will pour into your lap. The blessings come through people. All blessings happen through associations, everybody. Then it goes on to say, for the measure you use with others, they will in turn use with you. Isn't it interesting that giving is in the middle of a passage about attitudes of the heart? Smack dab in the middle. It talks about criticizing. It talks about judging. It, you know, and if you read all along the lines, it talks about love, forgiving. And how you dish out is what you get back. And there's one thing I've learned in life is this. When you find someone that is hyper judgmental about something or towards someone, they're always a hundred times more guilty of it than the other person. Maybe not a hundred, but way more. And Jesus said the same thing when he said, remove the plank from your eye before you remove the speck from your brother's eye. But we have a problem in America, and that is this. We judge people's weaknesses based on our strengths. So when we judge others, we base it on the standard of our strength to the standard of their weakness. But God says when you do that, that's how you're going to get measured back. And so when you see what God's talking about here, he's talking about conditions or attitude of the heart. And if we give out a lot of one thing, that's what we'll get back. And so we need to be careful when it comes to attitude. And God puts giving right in the middle. So now let's go to Deuteronomy 15, verse 7. And we're going to spend most of our time in Deuteronomy 15. And verse 7 says this, because we're going to see how God deals with a selfish heart. We're going to look at attitude here. And in verse 7, it says, is there, if there is among you a poor man of your brethren within any of the gates in your land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart, nor shut your hand from your poor brother, but you shall open your hand wide to him, willingly lend to him sufficient for his need, whatever he needs. Now, interesting verse of Scripture. So how does God deal with a selfish heart? Well, you've got to really read verse 9 and understand what he's talking about. Verse 9 says, Beware lest there be a wicked thought in your heart, saying, God calls selfish thoughts wicked thoughts. Saying, the seventh year, the year of release is at hand, and your eye being evil against your poor brother, and you give him nothing, and he cried out to the Lord against you, and it became sin among you. So God calls selfish thoughts wicked thoughts. God's talking about the year of Jubilee here. Oops. I almost ripped that right off my head. What is God talking about? He's talking about people not being able to collect their debt. See, in the Old Testament... 
what we need to understand is this, is that the year of Jubilee means you forgive everyone's debt that you are carrying. Everything you've given out, loaned. And so what's happening here is that God's dealing with selfishness and greed of not getting a return. And he's saying, don't let that be your motive and attitude. Because what was happening is, is the year of Jubilee was coming up, so people didn't want to help the poor and lend and give out because the time is so short, they probably aren't getting it back. So they're not going to get a return. And God's saying, don't let it be about what you get back. Don't let it just be about a return. Your attitude shouldn't be that way. That's selfishness. That's greed. It should be there's a need and the care of our heart and what God looks at is is our attitude towards that right. So what we learn is this, is that when it comes to why did God ask us to give, It's this, it's to work out, it's to work the greed and selfishness out of our hearts. That's why God ordained giving. Because have you ever noticed that when you're born, you're born selfish? Come on, how many of you admit you have kids? Raise your hand. Okay, how many of you had to teach your kids to give and not be selfish? Why did that change when we became old? We teach them, hey, give. And we'll look at them and go, Dad bought you that. That's not even yours. <laughs> Share with your cousin. No, it's mine. No, 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 not technically. And we teach them to be selfless and not greedy and to be selfish. Why does that change back when we get older? That's mine. God put giving in the Bible to work out that greed and selfishness, the tithes and the offering. God didn't do it for his benefit. God did it for our benefit. God put it in there for us, not for him. He's wanting to change our hearts from greedy to generous and grateful givers. That's what God wants to do in our lives. He did it for our sake, not his sake. So the first thing God talks about is dealing with the attitude. The attitude for giving isn't, if I give enough, I give to get. No, if you watch the television, that's what you see. You know, and that grieves my heart. Many of the things I see on TV really grieves my heart. We read it just will naturally happen. When you're a giver, God says you're going to get back. But it shouldn't be just about how much we get back. It should be about are we becoming more like him? Is it changing us to be more like him to where we're doing it because our motive is we want to bless people, we want to help people. If we see needs, people need to get saved, their lives need to be healed, their kids need to be restored. Are we helping the orphans? Are we doing the things across this world by being generous and by being a blessing to others? The, it's a benefit, it shouldn't be the motive. And that's what God is giving, is, and that's what God is telling us is, I'm doing this to help keep selfishness out of your life. And can I tell you one thing? There's one thing about men that usually won't change. Men, we are selfish kind of in one area, and that's when it comes to our food. How many know men, we really don't want to share, but your wife does want to share your food? This has probably happened to every man in this room that's gone on a date or with your spouse and you go to a drive-thru and you say, what do you want, dear? Nothing, I'll just have some of yours. (laughs) No, No, you won't, it's mine. You're not sharing my food. You're not giving my food away, it's mine. (laughs) It happened to all, I was like, no, no, no. 
Don't touch my French fries. Speaking of French fries, here's a story. Who owns your French fries? Who owns your French fries? Well, we just learned the wives do, didn't we? But no. I want to share a story with you. Um, you know, those of you, thank you for admitting you have kids. But you know, as a parent in raising your kids, think about this. As a parent, you've given them everything. Place to live. You've clothed them. You feed them. You un to your hurt, you take care of them. And you sacrifice for them. And your loving father, parents, mother. And then, you know, one day you decide as a dad, you know, you decide, yeah, I'm going to take my son out. I'm going to take him to McDonald's, get a happy meal and a toy. Just want to just bless him and be with him. And so you wake up Saturday morning, you take your kid, you go out, you buy a little happy meal, and you're letting him eat it, and you, and you smell those French fries. Now, you're just with your kid. You just blessed him. You don't, you know, and, and, and you're sitting there, and all of a sudden you decide you're going to, you reach over to grab one French fry, and your son goes, boom, they're mine. <laughs> Take your hands off, they're my fries. Do you ever think God feels that way? Everything is his. He's given us everything. How do you think he looks down sometimes at our attitude when he's like, I'm just asking you to tithe and to help the poor, reach your community. I want to bless you more than you realize. I've already blessed you with everything, and I'm just asking for a little bit, and we go, Poof! no. Thank you. That's why God starts with attitude. He deals with the heart. But you know what happens sometimes is when we give, we give and then we grieve afterwards. Regret. Oh, why did I do that? I could have done this. God deals with that. He talks about it. That's not the attitude we should ever have. So now if you go to verse 10, it says, you shall surely give to him. He said, you should give to these people that need it. I know the year of Jubilee is coming up, but look at what he says. You need to give to him, and your heart should not be grieved because you do give to him. Well, I'll give it to him. I probably won't get it. Look at this. Look at God's heart. When we give it the right way, look at what God says. Because of this thing, the Lord your God will bless you in all your works and in all that which I put to your hand. It should never be grieved about what we could have done. We need to understand when we do it God's way with the right heart and the right motive, even if we're not going to get anything back, God says it might only be six months before the year of Jubilee. But he said, I'll promise you this, everything you touch and put your hand to, I am going to bless you abundantly because you did it for me the right way. Amen? It isn't, oh... What I could have done. Because we have the right perspective. It's all God's. The world is God's. The earth is God's. Everything he has is his. Speaking of, I just remembered something. I need $100. Can someone help me? I need $100. Oh, awesome. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> I want to make sure you didn't change it out for that 10 you said, you know. Or, <laughs> praise the Lord. Thanks. You know, giving is about attitude. It's about willingness. It's about when somebody needs something to step up and just do it. Now, some of you are sitting there going, wow. I wouldn't have given it that quickly. He didn't even say what he needs, let alone a preacher. No, I'm just kidding give $100. He just asked for it. The guy gave him $100. He gave it. How could he do that? It's real easy. Because that was my $100, and before service, I handed it to him. <laughs> and I said, when I ask for it, just give it back. That's why he gave it so, so quickly. And did you notice he had no regret, and he didn't grieve over it? Why? It wasn't his. He returned it. Guess who owns all of your stuff? 
You know why after 30 plus years of living for the Lord, it's been hard at times. I'll be honest with you. There's been times it was hard to, to give. But we never grieved over it. You know why? Because this is God's. I just returned it to him. My tithe, it's not mine, it's his. See, tithe, people say well, the tithe belongs to the Lord. No, everything belongs to the Lord. I just have to learn to surrender. And you know why it's so easy for me to give tithes and offerings and why it's so easy for people to give? Because when you understand that you're a steward and that you're just taking care of what God gives you and that it's not yours, it's so much easier to give. I'm just returning it. And as I keep giving it and God and stewards and he trusts me, he just keeps blessing me and blessing us. That's why it was so easy to give. He didn't give and go, oh, gosh, no, I can't go out to lunch. I regret giving it. Because a steward in understanding God's way is everything I have is his. And it will come back. It will come back. See, when we realize that God is our source and not our job or the government, we realize that giving is three things. You ready? It's a test, it's a tool, and it's a trademark. We carry Christ. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. That's my trademark. But does our life prove it? And this is why God deals with the motive. Do you know that Jesus dealt with stewardship and stuff more than anything else in the Bible when he, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? One out of every three parables deals with your attitude towards stuff. This isn't a modern-day problem. It's a human nature issue. It's always been. 2,000 verses on money and stewardship and stuff, 500 on prayer, 500 on faith. This has always been why God has taught giving is because it gets the selfishness out of us and it makes us like him. And that's called a blessed life because of what happens after we give it that way. How do you develop a generous heart? I love this. Just think about this in every area of your life. Someone said generosity is a lifestyle in which we share all that we have, are, and ever will become as a demonstration of God's love and a response to God's grace. Just think if we woke up every day and said, I'm going to be that way. I'm going to be generous. I'm going to demonstrate my whole life is about his grace. We would change the city. Luke 6 says this. I'm sorry. Look at verse 14 now of developing a generous heart. God said, you shall supply him liberally from your flock, from your threshing floor, from your wine press, from what the Lord has blessed you with, you shall give to him. And again, what this is interesting about this verse is that what we're going to see here in just a second is that God's talking also about, you know, he's talking about helping those before the year of Jubilee. But in a second, you're also going to see that he talked about people being slaves for six years and in the seventh year they're to release their freedom and bless them as they left and fill up their life if they leave. But look at what Jesus said. Jesus says the same thing. He says it a little differently in Luke 6, verse 33 through 36. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that for you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. 
but love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be the sons of the Most High and daughters. For he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore, be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. He's kind to the unthankful and evil. You know, that's us. Because the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us and was generous and gave his life. While we didn't deserve it. And he expects us to be generous like him. If we're going to reach the loss, we're going to reach the world, we're going to change lives. But more than that, it changes us. God didn't do this for his benefit, for his sake. He did it for our sake. And he's, he's saying this is the way to a blessed life because it keeps out that greed and the selfishness that God knows will destroy us. It destroys our marriages. We become focused only on ourselves when he says, I need you to be focused on others. Because living in for, you know, every marriage, when it becomes focused on self, it disintegrates. Every relationship that is focused on how can I outgive the other one, what can I do to make your life better, those are the relationships that flourish and last. That's a blessed life. And that's what God wants for you. We had an awesome service on gratitude on Wednesday night. Wish you could have been here. But there was a phrase I talked about greatness. I'm sorry, about gratitude, and 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 that was this. Thankfulness is measured by the number of words. Gratitude is measured by the nature of our actions. That's awesome. Awesome. There was a gal just started in December. She took the card out, filled it out, and she was already serving this Sunday. She's like, yeah, I just want to give back. She goes, I just want to do something for him. That's gratitude. It's gratitude. Listen to this. Now verses 11 through 15. The port will never cease from the land. Therefore, I command you, saying, you shall open your hand wide to your brother to your poor and your needy. In your land, if your brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, is sold to you and serves you six years, then in the seventh year you shall let them go free from you. And when you send him away free from you, you shall not let him go away empty-handed. You shall supply him liberally from your flock, from your threshing floor, from your wine press, from what the Lord has blessed you with, and you shall give to him And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and that the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this thing this day. Every preacher that I listen to almost and people I know, there's one thing that we have in that if you've been serving the Lord and and just served him and lived for him, there's one thing that happens in quiet time and that is this is remembering where we've come from. I will never forget what God has done for me. That is why I give. That is why I bless as many people as I can. That's why I do what I do, not because I'm a pastor, but because I'm a Christian, and I want to see other people's lives get saved and turned around and healed, and their kids get freedom because I found freedom. And I remember, it's a matter of remembering what he's done. And guys, it is still in, in my life, and I, don't, I hardly ever talk about this, but I'll bring it up every now and then. You know, I don't know where I would be today without him. Because when I was 19, standing in my kitchen with a knife to my wrist, there was one thing that kept me from taking my life, only one, and that was I didn't know if I'd go to heaven. It's the only thing that kept me. And I look back to that day and then how God orchestrated bringing people into my life to get me into church and to turn my life around. And then when I started going to church, I mean, I got 
I prayed the prayer of salvation when I was in a Lutheran church when I was 12. So I knew I was saved, but I never grew. I didn't know anything beyond that. But that one experience saved my life. And I will be forever grateful for that. So I remember his mercy. I remember his goodness and everything he's done. And I want that to get into someone else's life. So every Sunday, it's not even an option. We just, my wife and I have always given. And, and it was years and years and years and years. We didn't give to get. We just gave because it's his kingdom. And we went years and years. And we had one car for 10 years. We rented for 11 years. Didn't go on a honeymoon for 10 years. We sacrificed going to places when everyone else was doing things. We didn't. Because in God's kingdom, payday doesn't come every Friday. But now after all these years from 19 and the last five years, and you know, you sacrifice. We moved to Belarus. We gave everything, sold our cars, sold everything and moved there with like 12 suitcases to our belongings. And that was in 93, and now it's 2019. And just in the last few years, we've had God do some things for us that have just been miraculous. We've had people, you know, send us on trips, and they paid for it. And then people see us gone, and, you know, it's funny as people say, oh, there's pastor on a trip again. You know, we've had a few trips given to us. But the sacrifice we made for years and years and years, God will do the same for you. But it isn't about what you're going to get. It's about what you're doing for him. And God says it will come back one day. You never judge another man's harvest until you know what they've sown and given up. Amen? You never do. You know, I was in Bible school, and, and, and I remembered him saying, don't criticize Billy Graham until you've saved as many people as he has. <laughs> I've never forgotten that. But you know, my wife and I, this was our prayer on the mission field years ago. And some of you, even in this room, have been an answer to a prayer we had back in 1993 when we gave everything away. We just said, Lord... And my wife could say this better than I can, but I'll, you'll get the gist of it. We just said, you know, Lord, if the day comes and we can go places, we'll do whatever you want, go anywhere, but just bring us places that we could see that we'd never be able to see on our own. And he did. Over 25 years later. But it's not about that. It's about touching lives. Amen. Amen. So as I close, I went, I'm two minutes past my time. As I close, I have two things I want to say. First one is a question. Second one is a statement, a quote. See if you guys can get this. If you have five frogs all sitting on a log, three of them decide to jump, how many do you still have on the log? Who's afraid to answer that question? Two, five, why five? Well, you guys know the answer to that. That's no. Yes, it's, you're awesome. You're exactly right. Deciding to jump and jumping are two different things. Right? Hear me here. Hear me. A lot of you signed love someone. I'm going to give. That's a decision. Now it's time to jump. Now hear me here about this message. Because some of you are feeling condemned. Church is not a house of condemnation, first of all. It's a place of grace and truth. We're trying to grow you and help you, first of all. It's not about a house of condemnation. I haven't done anything. I'm not a tither. I'm not a giver. I know. I don't think anybody woke up this morning wanting to just make someone else's life miserable. Anyone? 
Did you wake up and go, I'm going to make someone's life miserable today. I can't wait. I don't think most of us in this room wake up every day not wanting to do what God wants. I just think our lives are just so consumed with other things and we haven't been trained and we haven't been taught and we've gotten ourselves into messes and different things. I, I truly believe most of us in this room love God, wish we could do more, wish we could do things. I get it. But here's the decision. At some point, you got to jump and trust God. And when you do, you will see what he says. I will bless all you put your hand to. Let's end with this statement. Martin Luther said this, a religion that gives nothing, costs nothing, and suffers nothing is worth nothing. That's good, isn't it? Bow your heads, close your eyes. You know, some of you in this room today might be here and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. Jesus died for you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to help you. And if you're here and you say, Pastor Paul, I don't know if I'd go to heaven. I didn't either. But in about 30 seconds, I'm going to ask you to say a prayer with me. In about 30 seconds, I'm going to ask you just to raise your hand and look at me if you will say that prayer. So I'm going to ask you two questions and then I'm going to ask you to pray with me. First one is this. If you died today, do you know you'd go to heaven? And the second one is this. Are you right with God in your heart? If he asked you, if you were in heaven, why should I let you in? Are you right with him? Do you know that you'd go? I'm not going to ask you to come down, but I'm going to ask you to pray with me in your seat. So if that's you today, no one looking around, but if you say, Pastor Paul, I don't know if I'd go to heaven and I'm not right with God in my life and I want to this morning. And you want to take that first step to move towards him. No one looking around, but if that's you, would you lift your hand up and look at me and say, Pastor, I need to get my life right with you this morning because I want to pray with you. Because it is so, so important in your life. Now, this is what always happens right here is people are like, you know, I want to, but something on the inside of you is stirring, something on the inside of you is trying to get your attention, but it's like, no, I don't know. That is God's nudge. He loves you, and he wants to be your Lord. And if you're feeling that right now, and you didn't lift your hand and you know you should, just do it real quick. I'm going to look one last time and make sure that everyone in this room has that opportunity to make Jesus their Lord and Savior. Awesome. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Awesome. Another one. Thank you. Who else? Now I'm going to pray with you. But I want the whole church to say this prayer with me. And I want you to say this just as an act of support to those who lifted their hands. Say this. Say, Heavenly Father, come to you today and ask for forgiveness of my sins. But I make a choice today to live for you. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for forgiving me and accepting me. I'm now a child of God. And heaven is my eternal home. In Jesus' name, amen.